Welcome. So, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, four o'clock. Let me just get started. And welcome, everyone, to the Provost Lecture Series. And so we started the Provost Lecture Series last October when I became the Provost. And for the past year, we have uh, hosted um, seven speakers. And just for those of you who are the first time here, let me just quickly um, provide an overview of the purpose of the Provost Lecture Series. And so this series is meant to provide uh, an opportunity to celebrate milestones in the careers of OIS faculty members. So this is only open to our faculty members. And it covers a broad range of uh, um, um, kind of areas we want to celebrate. So for, for example, people getting promoted, uh, getting uh, either tenured or promoted from uh, assistant to associate or full professor. And also for those uh, who are going to retire. For example, last year we celebrated, uh, so two lectures, um, Ichiro Maruyama and also Ulf Skoglund, um, who left OIST in the past uh, 12 months. And uh, the last function is also we want to celebrate faculty members who received um, special awards. And uh, so today it's very special because uh, so Christine is going to give her, is going to kickstart our first provost lecture um, in the academic year. Um, so we, we took a little break during this summer because many people are traveling and so starting today, so we have several um, uh, provost lectures lined up. Um, so before um, I stop, I want to um, share my deep gratitude to many people within OIS who made the lecture series possible. So in particular, to everyone working at the office of the provost. And uh, so, so you have been working very hard to get uh, everything prepared, getting the snacks and the cleanup afterwards. So thank you. And also, so many people from uh, CPR uh, who designed uh, the posters uh, and doing the, the videotaping and uh, writing to the stories. And also core facilities. So the engineering section leader, Patrick Kennedy, has been providing a lot of support, uh, making plaques, 3D printed plaques for each uh, picture frame. Um, so. Thanks to Patrick. So for um, starting September, for the next uh, uh, about eight, nine months, we might have 10 lectures uh, lined up. So the next one will be Professor Sase, which is coming up very soon next week. Uh, so today, so Christine will give her lecture on making sense of the mess, and which uh, today's lecture will be chaired by Gail. Um, so some other upcoming lectures, and uh, I was able to find a picture of uh, Satoshi. I think that's the picture I discovered when, when Satoshi first came to OIST uh, many years ago. And yeah, Bing Chi will also uh, give a lecture um, to celebrate uh, um, his award from last year. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Gail. You can see I'm being a very efficient chair because I've got Christine sorting out my slides. Okay, well look, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It's a huge honour for me to be able to introduce Christine and to chair um, her lecture this afternoon. In many respects, Christine um, needs no introduction to any of you. Um, she's very well known to many of us in the faculty for her work on our behalf um, as our chair. Uh, for the woman in the audience, she's been a, a hugely supportive and strong advocate for women in science. And for the OIS students, um, she's, she's been an exceptional teacher, mentor, and advocate for them. So I kind of feel like, really, I could have just yes, 
said, you know, here, here's Christine, everybody. Um, but this afternoon, we're not here so much to, to look at the many other things that Christine does, but we're here to focus and celebrate her research, um, in particular, her award from the Society of Polymer Science, Japan. Um, this is a non-profit uh, organisation which is mostly made up of um, polymer scientists, engineers and, and managers in academia. And its primary role is to contribute to the development of polymer science and technology in Japan um, and worldwide. Now Christine is receiving this or received this award for her contributions to the synthesis of semiconductor polymers using direct ilation and catalyst transfer polymerization. Not easy for someone who gave up their chemistry back in their first year of university. Um, and she's going to explain um, about this in her presentation this afternoon, which is entitled Making Sense of the Mess. Now, this award is given to um, a researcher under the age of 45, which just made me jealous, you know. <laughs> Um, who's, who's achieved original and outstanding res uh, research results in all areas of polymer science and who is recognised to have made particularly remarkable progress in, in research achievements. But this is not the first and it's unlikely to be the last time that, that Christine is honoured for her scientific contributions. And this, little just, this map just shows Christine's academic as well as her physical journey around the world. So Christine grew up in Kobe but she began her scientific journey at Cambridge University um, where she completed a, a bachelor's degree in natural sciences and then she went on to complete her, her MSc and PhD um, in the Melville Laboratory of Polymer Synthesis at Cambridge. Um, following her PhD, she completed postdoctoral studies on semiconducting polymers for organic polyvoltaics with Jean, and I, I can't pronounce Jean's name, John Frisé in the Department of Chemistry at UC Berkeley um, and this work was supported by the Lindemann F Fellowship as well as Trinity College Junior Research Fellowship. Then in 2006 um, she joined the Materials and Engineering Department at the University of Washington as an Assistant Professor um, where she became the Robert J. Campbell Professor in 2017 and that was the position she held until 2001 when we were very fortunate to um, persuade her um, to, to join OIST. So we've, I think that was one of OIST's very fortunate um, achievements. So um, Christine has also held positions in the Department of Chemistry at, at Washington. Now Christine's research focuses on the synthesis of semiconducting polymers for organic el electronics in the, and in this area she's published over 100 um, papers. Um, she's currently on the editorial board of a number of journals, so she contributes not just to us here at OIST, but she contributes to the larger scientific community. So I'm going to stop talking, because actually you didn't come to listen to me today. Um, you actually came to listen to Christine. So Christine, we'd like to invite you now to make sense of the mess for us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, can everyone hear me with the microphone? Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and I was really impressed, Gail, that you could pronounce the chemistry terms. Uh, so today uh, we do quite a lot of work in my group, um, but what I'll be doing is really just presenting about the work that led to the award, specifically about the synthesis of semiconducting polymers using tar uh, catalyst transfer and direct ilation polymerization. So I'm hoping that even though you're not experts in the field, that by the end of this talk, you'll know what those terms mean. Um, Gail said I didn't need introduction, but I actually assume that you wouldn't know me. <laughs> uh, so for my introductory tree slides, I do have some information about me, but I'm really pitching this bit to the students and researchers in this field uh, to provide some context about maybe possible career development for you as well. Uh, so first of all, I guess some background about me. I am mixed race, half Japanese, half British. Um, and so from like when, when I was born, I was used to juggling cultures, uh, Japan and in England, and also Jap uh, languages as well. So juggling both languages. 
Um, in terms of the degrees, so all my degrees are in chemistry, and I've highlighted the fact that I moved to material science and engineering uh, as a faculty. And I guess for most of you in the audience, that probably doesn't seem much of a change. Like, even at OIST, when we're doing a search, we lump chemistry and material science together, but actually, they're not the same at all. Um, in fact, even Keshav Dani said, Actually, I associate material science with physics a lot more than chemistry, and that's actually very true. Um, but for me, that was a big transition. I was working in a science department predominantly, and then I moved to an engineering department. And between those two departments, people approach scientific questions very differently. Um, other things were just the, the words that were used. Like when talking about the same concept, people would actually use different words. So from a professional point of view, I also got used to juggling languages as well. So throughout my life, I guess, I've been kind of bridging uh, barriers, as it were. And that's really what attracted me to come to OIST in 2021, uh, to try and work in this interdisciplinary environment and try to contribute globally uh, from that point of view. Um, along the way, I have held a number of other positions as well, and this is what I was referring to for the students and researchers. So I was in charge of some PhD programs. Um, I actually did a huge amount of education and outreach work, so trying to get um, minoritized students uh, to come to do research um, at the University of Washington, uh, but also bringing high school students uh, who were from low-income families to come and do research. Uh, so I did a lot of work in that area as well. Um, and then as Gail mentioned, I've had some appointments for journals as well. And I just want to point out these things uh, to the students just to highlight that I know at OIST it always seems like there's only research that can be done by faculty, but actually that's not true. There's lots of other things that you can do in academia. And so when you're thinking about your career path, I hope you'll just consider the fact that in academia there are multiple options as well. Uh, finally, um, just before I came, I was the chair of the department, and the chair of the department actually does everything. Uh, they manage the finance, uh, they're the HR person for the department, they're ultimately in charge of the undergraduate, graduate, masters and PhD programs. Um, we hire faculty, we negotiate with the faculty, and so we really did everything. So based on that experience now, when I, I thought, oh, chair of the faculty, uh, that I can do that in my sleep. Um, but actually, it's been one of the hardest things <laughs> I've ever done. Um, and someone said that it's really like being the herder of fleas. So sorry, faculty. But, <laughs> but sometimes it really has been like that. Um, and I now currently am an associate editor for another journal, Macromolecules, which is like the main uh, journal for polymer chemistry. And, on, and also, um, I'm currently the president of the IUPAC polymer division. So whenever there's a new element name announced, there'll be a big announcement. And the people who make that big announcement is IUPAC. So they're in charge of developing standards and nomenclature and terminology for chemistry. Uh, so right now, I'm the president of the polymer division, and it's been really, really great fun. It's like the United Nations, but for chemistry. And so once a year, we get together. There's people from literally all over the world, and it's been really fascinating to get these people together and work towards this common goal of uh, making chemistry more understandable uh, to the world. So on that note, um, I'm going to... Uh, no, actually, I have one final thing that I should have mentioned. Uh, last, but most importantly, um, I'm a parent to two kids. Uh, my husband is here. Um, and without them, I would not be able to do all that I do. And my husband said I should mention some hobbies. <laughs> um, my main hobby is sleep. Not that I get enough of it. I do not get enough of it. And I put things in brackets, things I used to do and aspire to do at some point in the future. Uh, so I do need to get my work-life balance in order at some point. Um, on that note, I transitioned to the research. Um, first and foremost, I really need to thank my current group members, but also all my past group members, because everything I'll be talking about today, I did not do a single experiment in any of the things that I'll talk about today. Uh, so thank you to everyone uh, for their contributions. 
So in order to really try and explain uh, semiconducting polymer synthesis, uh, catalyst transfer, and direct correlation, I do want to give an intro about material science. So I'll start with that. So material science 101, um, it's a completely underrepresented field at OIST. So what is material science and engineering? So at its most simplistic level, it's really a study that involves trying to look at the relationship between the structure of your material. So this would be the atomic structure and correlating that structure to the properties of the material. Uh, the structure can be altered through the processing um, and connecting all of that to ultimately an application that you have in mind. Uh, so we'll always be looking at the performance of the materials in different applications as well. And material science really has been key to technological developments throughout the years. So in order to emphasize that, um, there are actually eras in the past that have been named after the primary uh, material that was in use at the time. So the first one was uh, the Stone Age. Um, back in 3000 BC, the stone, stone was the primary material that was used, so it's the Stone Age. Any guesses for what came after the Stone Age? Bronze, I heard bronze. Yeah, so the next one is Bronze Age. And again, it was called the Bronze Age because that was the primary material that was used. It's a metal, you need higher temperatures to process it. Uh, people had figured out how to use fire then, uh, so it was bronze. What was next? Yeah, Iron Age. So iron, a uh, higher melting point metal, you need higher temperatures to be able to process it, so it came later. But because it is a higher melting temperature material, it's significantly stronger um, and therefore much more applicable. So some people would say that it's still the Iron Age. It's still a very widely used material. Uh, but others would argue that it's now the Plastic Age or the Silicon Age at the moment. But regardless, without new materials development, we do not have uh, advances in technology. So at least from my personal point of view, it's really important to have a material science as a discipline. So when we talk about materials, um, as a material scientist, we uh, categorize them into four different areas. Uh, so one is metals. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, the other is ceramics. And the one that I'll really be talking about today, uh, which is my area of expertise, is polymers. Um, I mentioned that there were four, so the fourth one actually is a combination of any of the two, and you get a composite. So whenever we find that we can't get the properties that we need using a single material, then we make a composite combining uh, more than two of them. So polymers, I actually became really interested in polymers as early as a high school student. So we, polymers literally are everywhere. This is a polymer, the table is a polymer. Um, everything that you use or touch on a daily basis is made of a polymer. And that was something that really fascinated me. And especially right now, uh, polymers have a bit of a bad name, has plastics, microplastics. That's what you hear in the media a lot. But actually, even we are made of polymers. So DNA, proteins, uh, those are in fact types of polymers. And a lot of polymers are used for biological applications as well. So for example, tissue engineering and drug delivery. So what makes polymers are a little bit difficult, and this is where the mess comes into play, they are really very, very distinct from the other materials. And so metals and ceramics, they are not a mess. They're really easy to, I shouldn't, uh, there aren't any metallurgists in here, so it's okay. But metals and ceramics are very, very easy to study. And the reason for that is that they have very well-defined periodic structures. They have what we call a crystal structure and a unit cell. So we know where the atoms are, and if we know what the unit cell looks like, we know what the rest of the material looks like. Um, they have long range order, and they have a very clear chemical formula. So if you have a chunk of salt, even regardless where, of where I probe, I can say that the chemical formula of that is NaCl, and it doesn't change. So 
All of this makes it easy to characterize. It's easy to see what you have using a variety of characterization techniques. Um, admittedly, they are not without fault in that a lot of the crystal structures have what we call defects in them. So sometimes you'll have atoms missing. There might be a small atom impurity in there, so it'll kind of fit in the gap. Sometimes a bigger atom will replace an entire atom, so you can have defects. Uh, sometimes you'll even have a row of atoms missing from the crystal structure. But even those we can see, uh, we know what they are, and it's easy to characterize. And actually, in most applications, we want to have those defects uh, because they do things like strengthen the material. So when you're going shopping for jewelry, you would never really buy 24 karat gold unless it's for special occasions. Because it's pure, it's soft, it, it scratches easily. So normally we would actually buy something else that's been intentionally doped um, because it's a little bit more robust. Other doping examples for example, uh, uh, for things like silicon. So silicon, pure silicon at room temperature shows not very much conductivity at all. So here again, uh, we introduce defects intentionally uh, so that we have some form of room temperature conductivity and make it as a usable material. But just to summarize what I said in the past two slides, metals and ceramics, they are based on, on crystal structures, they're easy to study, and so therefore they're not particularly messy systems. But now this is where, is where the polymers come to play. Uh, polymers, in contrast, they're a very, very, very big mess. So uh, if you have a polymer sample, within the polymer sample, you'll just have chains with different lengths. All of them will be different lengths. Um, other things like just of simplicity will draw polymers to be linear, so a straight line. So we'll kind of draw it like this. But in fact, it's rarely like that. It's actually sometimes branched, so things will be going off. Sometimes the branch will be connecting to the other chain, so we'll have things called cross-linking taking place. Uh, so we'll have things like that. But also from a defect point of view, so if you could imagine that these are uh, molecules all connected together. Sometimes when we make the polymer, things go wrong. Well, things always go wrong. And so we accidentally introduce a monomer in there that we didn't mean to. But here again, we can't characterize them. So for example, this batch right here, there are three defects between three polymer chains, but we cannot distinguish it from this one, which also has three defects along three chains. So here, in fact, you have two perfect polymers and one defected polymer chain, but we can't distinguish between those two. And that's because whenever we characterize these, because of the mess, we can only characterize the average of the material. So whenever we're talking about molecular weights of polymers, we only ever talk about average molecular weights. We can't give a precise molecular weight. Uh, the same with the chemical formula. Again, out of simplicity, we'll say, oh, uh, polyethylene is C2H4. That's, that, that's what we'll say. But actually, it's not really that. Um, other things like when we're talking about defects, again, we can only talk about averages. So there's a lot of issues with just characterizing a polymer at all. So these are the problems that we have when just considering a single polymer chain. But of course, when we're using it as a material, uh, the material isn't just a single polymer chain. It's a collection of them. And so when we collect them, things are complicated again. So most metals and ceramics, it's just a crystal. But in the case of polymers, there are what are called semi-crystalline materials for the most part. I am simplifying, but for the most part, they're what, is, what are known as semi-crystalline materials. So you have this crystalline domain, and then you have these amorphous domains. And these crystalline domains, again, we can characterize using similar methods that are used in metals and ceramics. We can use a variety of like, x-ray or electron uh, diffraction techniques. 
But then when it comes to the amorphous mess, which is just all these squiggly lines, that we, do, we cannot characterize it. And so for the most part, we just really do forget about it. We pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, and to be honest, for most applications, that's okay. So if you think about polymers for a plastic bag, like polyethylene, we don't really need to care too much about that amorphous mass. But then the special type of polymer that my group works on is that we specialize on polymers for electronics applications. And when it comes to electronics, we can't be so blasé. We actually need to be quite a bit more precise in order to get high performance materials. So we can no longer really ignore the defects. We can't really ignore the amorphous domains. We need to start to be able to control those. And so the question then becomes, well, how do we deal with that messy system that we have? So there's two approaches that one could take about this. Uh, one is to really keep on developing those characterization tools so that we can start to really tease out the details of all that's happening. And there are most definitely people who are doing that, but ultimately there are limitations in the resolution or the accuracy of the characterization that one can do. So then the other approach is, well, let's start making polymers that don't have the defects in the first place. So make more well-defined materials that don't have the defects in the polymer chain and try to make polymers which all have the same lengths and the same molecular weights. And this is really where our work comes into play. So with all of that backdrop, um, one of the big goals in my group has been, well, can we design and synthesize semiconducting polymers with the level of precision that nature can? So nature has absolute control over the synthesis of its polymers. So if you think about DNA or think about proteins, the molecular weights are absolute. There is no molecular weight distribution. All of them have the same length. And if you think about DNA and proteins, again, you have sequence specificity in the monomers. So the question was, well, can we try to do that with semiconducting polymers as well? Um, but mimicking nature is actually really quite slow and tedious, and it's really quite expensive as well. So the other question was, well, can we do so efficiently in a much more environmentally benign manner? And this is what led us uh, to the SPSJ, the uh, Polymer Science uh, Society Award, which was for the development of synthesis of semiconducting polymers using direct dilation and catalyst transfer polymerization. So with that introduction, and don't worry, I'm not talking for that long. I'm not, uh, I'll stop soon. Uh, what I do want to try and actually do is explain to you what hopefully synthesis of semiconducting polymers. That bit makes sense, hopefully. Yes? OK, good. Um, but what I'll be doing for the rest of the talk is how direct relation and catalyst transfer come into play uh, in order to achieve those. So I don't want to scare you with chemical structures, uh, but uh, here are some chemical structures. Uh, here are some examples of polymers that are used in electronics applications. And some are simple, so this one's a pretty simple example, but as you can see, progressively, they get more and more complicated. And these complicated ones have amazing performance, like these polymers can match the performance of silicon now, and uh, it's really the complexity of the structure that allows us to complete, compete favorably with the inorganic semiconductors. Um, you don't need to worry too much about the details um, of the actual structure, but one of the things that I want to point out is there's one feature that every single one of them have in common, uh, which is that they're all what we call conjugated polymers, which is that they are a string of rings. So here's a ring, a uh, ring. So it's all and other ones, ring, ring, ring. So if you could imagine that in order to get electronic conductivity, what we need to do is to string together all these rings in a linear manner, then we will get electronic conductivity out of the material. 
So in terms of developing better ways to polymerize, that's what we really focus on. How do we connect all those rings together? And so schematically, this is really what we do. Uh, we have two rings that we connect. But then if you imagine a ring, there's multiple points that it could connect. So how do you specify where and where it connects? And how do you make sure that all the connections are linear? Like we don't want any kinks. We don't want any branches forming. So how do we make sure that you're only really uh, making a linear chain? And the way that we do this in chemistry is by introducing what we call functional groups. Uh, so these are designed uh, such that they don't react with one another. In other words, we avoid what we call homocoupling. They only react with each other. So by judicial positioning of these functional groups, uh, we can get this, what we call cross-coupling to occur. And that's what, how we get uh, the rings connecting linearly. Um, my animation's gone funky, but that's okay. And just having functional groups isn't enough to get that reaction to go. Uh, we need to help get it, give it an additional oomph to get that reaction to go. So we, in order to do that, we introduced a catalyst. Um, and again, you can ignore the details of this, but the catalyst comes in, connects the rings together, and it spits the connected rings out. And the catalyst uh, does that over and over again. And by doing it over and over again, uh, you get that linear polymer forming. And normally, if you do this, you'll see that the catalyst is completely unbound uh, to the product. And when it's unbound, this catalyst can then just, it just if you imagine it's, it's really just a mixture of all these reagents. Everything is swimming around in a solution. So how it reacts is uh, just a matter of probability when it crashes into each other. So when they're unbound, this is completely uncontrolled and the coupling can be taking place anywhere in your reaction flask. And so here, even though we've installed functional groups to make it linear, we don't have any control over the molecular weight, the length of the polymer. And so the trick that we do, and this is what catalyst transfer is, we somehow bind the catalyst to the growing chain. So one ring connects, the catalyst is bound. Uh, imagine that a blue, I should have animated this, sorry. Another blue one comes in, it binds, and when it does, the catalyst jumps over. Another one comes in, the catalyst jumps over. So we have this catalyst walking. And it's this process that's known as the catalyst transfer. And by having this catalyst transfer or catalyst walk, what we enable it to do is we make sure that only one monomer gets added one at a time to this growing polymer chain. And so we start to be able to achieve much better control over the actual polymer synthesis. And this is what enables us to make a much more well-defined polymers than we were previously able to. So I felt that I had to show some actual real results. So here is a result slide. Uh, this is from quite a way back, but this was a breakthrough result for us where we successfully managed to do a really, really highly controlled synthesis of a semiconducting polymer. Uh, the molecular weights are well defined. Uh, the molecular weight distribution is extremely narrow. Um, it's completely defect free. Uh, so at the time that we published this work, uh, this course wanted to a report of a polymer with the least amount of defects that had been reported at the time. And so what's great about it, um, by virtue of have, having less defects, our polymers are more crystalline. And this is what this bigger shoulder is showing. Um, other things as well. So in polymers, N groups are considered to be defects. And if you look at this picture, hopefully that'll make sense. So if this is my polymer chain, if there's an N group, that's really like cutting short your wire. So if you cut your wire, you won't have any electronic conduction. So having an N group in the middle of a crystal uh, does uh, prevent electronic conduction uh, from occurring. So by doing our synthesis, we're really able to control what kind of end group we have. 
and be able to minimize the bad effects that an end group can have in your material. But even better, uh, what we can do by controlling the length is completely avoid having the end groups in the middle. So we can synthesize polymers that are ex exactly the length of the crystal or exactly double the length of the crystal. And by doing that, we make sure that the end groups are only on the sides and here in the middle is defect free. And by doing so, we get much higher performance out of our materials. Uh, so that's kind of uh, the catalyst transfer aspect of the work. So the other portion was direct aerolation. And again, here again, I'm showing that same slide that I had with the examples of semiconducting polymers. And again, just as a reminder, our goal is just to connect those rings. And so, um, and looking at these more complicated polymers, to make them, it's uh, an amazingly tedious process. So I'm just showing you this example here. We didn't name it, somebody else named it, but it's a polymer known as D18. Uh, D18, uh, performs amazingly well in solar cells, so in photovoltaics. Uh, it gives a solar cell efficiency of 18%, and if you consider commercial silicon devices that are 25%, uh, this is a really pretty amazing polymer. But if you see, it's just 15 steps, and what that means uh, from our point of view, that's two or three months worth of work in order to get that single polymer. It's a huge amount of work. So, just trying to simplify that process and trying to minimize the number of steps we have to do would be hugely beneficial in commercializing uh, organic, organic electronics more. So I've already introduced to you the more traditional way that we make, it, make the polymers. We intentionally install functional groups and that really dictates uh, how your polymers are synthesized. Um, but in direct aerolation, what we do is that one of the monomers we make unfunctionalized. So now uh, we don't have anything directing the reaction, but the goal is still to be able to synthesize a polymer despite the fact that we don't have anything on this particular monomer. So um, from an efficiency point of view, being able to do this is really great. Going from here to this functionalized monomer requires a few steps. So if we don't have to do those few steps, it simplifies everything. Um, but also, usually these things that I've circled in purple, they're really toxic chemicals. So if we can avoid those toxic chemicals too, that would be hugely beneficial. And so this reaction right here, where we have one functionalized monomer and one just with hydrogens, uh, this reaction is known as direct aerolation. So aerolation is connecting rings. Direct is because, well, we do it directly. So that's what the term is. But if you think about it, well, if there's nothing directing the reaction, then how do we still ensure that it's still a linear chain and how do we get it to go? Um, to cut a long story short, uh, we did achieve an example of this uh, where not only we managed to control the reaction of a carbon-hydrogen bond, but we also can control the molecular weight. Uh, so not only were we able to develop a reaction uh, that allows for defect-free polymer synthesis, uh, we can also do it in a slightly more environmentally benign manner in a slightly more efficient way. So that's the direct aerolation force. And then Gail's looking bored. So <laughs> no, I just, I just have three slides left. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so moving on, uh, related to this, I just want to give you a brief glimpse of our uh, latest achievement from last year, uh, which is, so this is great, uh, one functionalized monomer, one unfunctionalized. But what would actually be even more powerful from a synthesis point of view is this, how do you react to completely unfunctionalized monomers and be able to make that polymer that way. Um, and as I mentioned last year, we published a paper um, that was, uh, for us at least, a really big breakthrough, 
where we were able to uh, further the understanding of a particular system. Um, and I won't go into detail now, but I just did want to highlight that kind of uh, the further achievements that we have related to this area. So um, we do perform other research that's a lot more application oriented. I did not present that at all, um, but we do do some application oriented work. So I'll work on trying to get more awards so that I can present to you again. Um, so we do do that. Um, but I hope at the end, I hope that you have a better understanding of what catalyst transfer and what direct correlation mean. Hands up if you understand a little bit more. Lee Ryan stopped putting his hand up. <laughs> but anyway, um, but by having these synthetic techniques, bit by bit, we are untangling the mess uh, related to polymers. So we collaborate a lot with other people trying to tease out the details, um, trying to understand what affects fundamental properties of polymers. Um, other concluding notes, as I mentioned, I made a big jump from chemistry to material science. And at the time, it was pretty terrifying. Um, despite the fact that my colleagues hired me, uh, they kept on complaining, oh, you don't do material science. You need to do more material science. So I was kind of, a little bit left out. And also teaching, I hadn't taken a single material science class ever in my life, but all of a sudden I was standing in front of 100 students teaching material science. So it was a pretty terrifying experience, but overall, in conclusion, it was definitely a good uh, growth for me. Uh, so I'd just say that it's good to be outside of your comfort zone, uh, within reason. Um, but finally, a collaboration between disciplines um, allows us to answer questions that we couldn't answer before. Uh, so like the things that I talked about today, I would have never considered pursuing if it wasn't for the fact that I had uh, been introduced to a new discipline. And finally, uh, it really does take a village uh, for everything to get everything done. So I want to thank um, my research group, uh, my family, uh, but also the entire OIST community uh, for providing support to do our research. So thank you. Oh, I thought I had a thank you slide, but thank you.
thank you so much for taking the time, but also making it accessible. I think maybe I might have carried on with chemistry if there'd been people like you teaching at the time. So thank you very much for that. We have time for some questions. Uh, and because you're now all experts in this, thanks to Christine Spector, I expect there's some excellent questions. Thank you. So um, I do feel like slightly more of an expert now than I was before, which was just an absolute zero in the field of polymer science. So thank you. Um, just a really general question: What does the pi in your, uh, in your uh, unit yeah, name yeah, yeah. represent? It, it is related to the rings. Uh, I don't how much chemistry. Do you remember your benzene ring? Uh, yes. Okay, do you remember? Yeah. So benzene ring, single one, double one, single one, double one. That creates an electron. Thanks for the lecture. I used to be into chemistry in high school, so it's just quite nice to see for uh, chemical compounds again. Um, I was wondering about these semiconductors. Um, obviously, there are crystalline semi semiconductors like silicon. It seems from the thing you were presenting that you are trying to make the polymers more like crystals. And I'm wondering if that, what is the advantage of using polymer 